done 10 shows already, and this is uh, the 11th, and we're doing nine more. Now we're going to the East Coast, we're hitting DC, uh, New York, yeah. we're heading back to the West, uh, San Francisco and Seattle, and then I go home. Um, so this is my co-producer, Sunny Season. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of one of the masters that we interviewed in the film. He's here, Master Sifu Guru Ron Baliki. Stand up, sir, be recognized. Pretty good. <laughs> so we can do a 10 to 15 minute Q&A and then we will uh, proceed with the posters. Posters. <laughs> yes, sir. How do, we, how do you push it to the other uh, states? I mean, how do we start? Oh, uh, everything has been happening through word of mouth, so just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. It's, it's, it's just mostly through word of mouth. Facebook. Uh, while while uh, Master Ron Balik is here, you can ask him some questions too. Or he's shy tonight. Okay. Ah, uh, there was someone who was raising a hand over there. Any questions from the I audience? Any more? Ah, uh, yes. Oh, uh, we we are still uh, touring the film, and the uh, and the uh, the film is not commercially released yet. But once it is, you know, we, we will we will update you. Uh, everything is in our Facebook group page. Just search the bladed hand and click join and. You can get all the updates there. Yes, sir. Uh, what was it like, or what was the difference between filming, say, in the Philippines and filming in the States? It was a little colder here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not much difference. It, it, it was a matter of me, uh, you know, getting everyone's permission to film them. And uh, the reception has been Everyone has been open to to me interviewing them. Fortunately, um, in the Philippines, it was a little easier because I, I could easily access them through a text or email. Uh, here in the U.S., uh, my primary purpose for coming here last January 2010 was to interview uh, Guru Dan Inasanto and uh, Jeff Imada. And uh, when Guru Dan introduced me to his class one night, uh, and said that I was there uh, filming for a documentary on FMA, uh, the, there were other students who said, oh, you want to meet so-and-so? You want to meet this, this guy and that guy? Hey, want to interview them? So that's how the interviews piled up. And fortunately, everyone was, was receptive. Uh, yes, sir. If you could have the mic back, but before uh, before you did the documentary, you didn't do FMA. What made you want to do this? Uh, the, what compelled me to to produce this documentary really was a matter of cultural pride. Uh, I used to practice uh, Shorin Ryu in my youth, and got distracted by music, and uh, yeah, uh, a few pounds later. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but uh, when I learned that that FMA has been used in Hollywood for 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 some decades now, and then uh, has been in use in military and law enforcement systems around the world, I thought there is something that I have not been uh, that, that that I need to look back to. Uh, I, I had our niece for PE in college for one semester. I didn't think much of it. Maybe because it wasn't taught well, or, or for whatever reason. Um, but but knowing all these stories uh, made me research the matter even more. And uh, and this is how I, I I felt that this story needed to be told. And uh, so that is what you just saw. Yeah, when I when I uh, started promoting this film, it was still in production, and 
i thought that i could release it earlier and i ended up over the last two years postponing it three or four times this is because some of the masters that i wanted to interview were abroad like uh yuli romo who was uh busy what was he doing teaching the moroccan royal guard so i had to wait for him for like eight months to return to the philippines and so when he did uh, i was finally able to get him on camera there were several other masters who whose whose schedules i had to you know patiently wait on that's that's mostly the reason for the delay oh, oh the other thing is um, at some point i i uh, it was brought to my attention. Originally, the logo that we have on the bladed hand, the Kampilan, where uh, the, the title is spelled out in, it, it was meant to look like Filipino ancient script by Bayan, but uh, it, it's in English, so the bladed hand. The orientation of the curve on the handle was wrong, or something like that, and some moros complained. <laughs> you know, and, and even said that, this guy is using a Moro blade as his logo for FMA, but there is no Moro representation whatsoever in the film. So I said, okay, oversight. <laughs> Clearly, I didn't know anything about FMA. So I said, okay, I will rectify the situation. We found a, a Moro master whom, whom you saw in the uh, second segment where we were discussing the history of FMA. His name is Ibrahim Hushim from Zamboanga in the Philippines. Yeah. Anyone from, you're from Zamboanga? All right. So, um, yeah, we, we found him in Manila, which was convenient for me. Um, I really wanted to film in Mindanao, but uh, I didn't have any connections. Um, so we found Master Ibrahim. And uh, he was gracious enough to show us uh, what the Moro fighting arts actually look like. And uh, yeah, that, that was a privilege. But yeah. Tell him at what point he came into the editing process. <laughs> he came in late. <laughs> uh, I, was, I, I thought I, the film was already complete when all these things were brought to my attention. Like the, the misorientation of the logo and, and the moral representation in the film that was lacking. So that was another thing that caused the delay. I had to get a, a moral master in the film and uh, thankfully there was Kaibs. Uh, initially I went by the popular names. So there were, there was Dose Pares, there, were, there was Balintawak. I had to find teachers, you know, representatives for each. Um, my only connection really in the beginning in the FMA world was Mumbaki Foronda. He's a longtime friend, a friend of mine for the last 20 years or so. And uh, like I said, I didn't think much of Arnis before. And uh, he got the gig with the Russian Special Forces in 2005. And uh, I, th I said, oh, okay, nice, congratulations. <laughs> um, so, the original concept for the bladed hand was actually just the first segment that you saw. I only wanted to make a 10-minute feature on FMA, and, and all I knew in the FMA world was Mumbaki Foronta. And uh, so the first segment that you saw was the original bladed hand. Everything else, you know, was a result of uh, our discussions regarding the who's who in, in the FMA world. So I, I created a wish list, and uh, fortunately, all of them agreed to be filmed. Uh, any more? Any more? Yes, sir. By my own bank account. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I uh, I knew that a story like this would not be interesting to any um, institutions in the Philippines. So I thought, okay, I'll do this myself. Whatever happens, I'll do it. Thank you.
That's why we're all buying posters. <laughs> the posters are being sold in order for me to not swim back home to Manila in December. <laughs> um, and, and more questions, sir? Yes, sir. All the way back. Oh, yes, okay. Um, when the earnest bill was signed into law, the agreement was the sporting aspect of our list would be given, uh, the development of the sporting aspect or the governance of it would be given to the Philippine Sports Commission. So they are in charge of, of uh, figuring out the rules and, and whatnot, developing the sport. Uh, so far we have not seen anything happen yet. Um, there is no one particular government organization in the Philippines or department that is championing the Filipino martial arts, unfortunately. I just want to put my uh, two cents into it. That is, uh, and I've said this at most of our Q&As, in that people in the Philippines, particularly the government, pay attention to what happens in the United States with Filipino Americans. So if we make noise here, they pay attention back home. So as Jay said earlier, any of the institutions back home probably would not have taken such interest in uh, FMA. But since we've been here um, promoting FMA and, and the particular uh, people that have been interviewed, there is a lot more interest being made back home in being written up in the papers, the media following and such. So uh, someone asked about how we can do our part. Just keep talking, keep teaching, keep promoting our culture. And we're not talking about just the FMA culture, but our influence on people in showing our respect to elders, our family units, our cuisine. Mm -hmm. So. That's what I think we can do uh, on a one-to-one -one -one basis, and that we spread it that way. We make noise here, they pay attention back home. We make it big here, they'll pay attention back home. I tried to get this screen in the Philippines uh, so many times. Um, I did a press premiere in the Philippines uh, last July 7, and uh, uh, that was very well attended, and we got a lot of media mileage through that. But um, after that, we were able to screen in, in, a, in a high school in Baguio City, and also privately through uh, the University of Santo Tomas in Manila. And uh, two days before I flew to LA, uh, we had a screening in Makati at a, at a restaurant. Um, but as far as you know, getting it screened in theaters like this, zero. Um, not even in Cebu, where uh, I, I got um, people saying, uh, oh, yeah, we can do that, we'll, we'll, we'll help you, we'll set it up. And uh, it's been months since I heard from them. So uh, now a lot of people are asking, because we've gotten a lot of publicity. Um, one of the uh, columnists in, in one of the major newspapers in the Philippines called the Philippine Daily Inquirer, who's based in Hollywood. His name is Ruben Nepales. Uh, he is the, the president of the Hollywood Foreign Press. Uh, he's the one who does the Golden Globes and such. Uh, he was at the LA screening and he wrote about this. And uh, uh, what I heard was it was a three page spread in the newspaper that was published on a holiday, so a lot of people saw it. And a lot of people now are asking, oh, so what, when's you screening in the Philippines? And all I could say is, set it up. <laughs> you know, because um, I made a film, but I, I, I don't set up events, I need help. So hopefully the, the noise we've been making here will, will uh, get people to want to set up screenings for us. As of now, we don't have any yet. Oh, who were reluctant? Uh, 
Just one, and he's not in the field. <laughs> yeah, but, but fortunately, all of the guys that you saw agreed to be a part of this documentary. So it's, I don't know, it's a stroke of luck maybe, or, or my good looks. That, you know. <laughs> I think, personally, uh, with Jay's background of not being uh, an FMA practitioner at the time, he started making the movie. He came at it with a more objective perspective. Whereas, you know, uh, most FMA groups are a little cautious yeah. of, of, of showing their stuff in that they don't want other styles or systems to know what they're doing or may accuse of me if I went in there, they say, oh, well, who are you spying for? That's not the case with Jay. First of all, I think Jay comes across uh, very sincerely, and uh, to put their particular art uh, on a project like this, they, they understand the scope of what's being, what's being done, especially when they haven't been recognized before. For the most part, if you're not an FMA practitioner, no one here is going to know who uh, Bert Labaniego is. But fortunately for us, now he has a legacy that he can pass on, and I think um, a big part of this movie is to give them tribute. They don't look for anything special treatment. You know, they're they're just there teaching the art and uh, propagating the culture, and just just to give them that acknowledgement that uh, they're doing something good for the people is that's all they could ask for. And uh, I'm glad that Jay really went out of his way to make these people feel welcome and honored. Out of all the martial arts, I mean, outside of like the Bruce Lee thing that everybody talks about, you know, there's not too much out there really well documented. And I think that we're so blessed to have him. And I, I just want to say it is he's done a tremendous, tremendous thing for us in FMA. And uh, I feel honored and humbled to be part of this. And I thought I would be there for like maybe a snippet or a word. I was like, you know, way that he put me in so much of this. But um, I don't know if I'm worthy of everything that he's given me, but he's been so gracious. And I think it's amazing that the light that he's shown every art, because a lot of people try to outstage each other. I think it's, you know, it's ego driven. We all are, you know. But he's just such, I mean, I'm surprised at how fair balanced it really is. And I'm so proud that I got to be in, a, in this and it's going to outlive me. And it's amazing that he did it. And I think everybody in here who does FMA really should acknowledge this man. Please put the word out because he's done a big, big solid for us. And I, my name is Salam and uh, thank you. One more thing, sir. I, I would hope for the Filipinos in the audience to understand if you were not an FMA practitioner or may have had your own preconceived notions of what FMA was, that this sheds a little light upon your lack of understanding. That is much more than swinging a stick or violence or anything of that nature because you are here today because these men and their ancestors defended you in order for you to propagate your family and your lineage. So spread the word that we have something unique. If you think about it, really, like Professor Hokano said, what about our culture is unique and us contributing to the world in, in many facets. Why is it that Europeans and other uh, countries value our Filipino martial arts so much when it's right in our own backyard and we're not paying attention to it? It doesn't make sense to me. And of course we have people like Groran here. And that's not taking anything away from Filipino FMA teachers because they're a part of it as well. But here's a man who probably speaks better Tagalog than I do, you know, who respects it so much. And Ron and I have been friends for such a long time. We started Power Rangers together. <laughs> anyway, it's because, it's because of the culture and what it presents that I believe that Ron has such a strong affinity and passion for it. And I think that's something that exists in all of us. If we can take anything away from this movie, is to find your own passion, as Jay did. You know, 
I praise you enough. I'll shut up. Okay. But just round of applause for Jake, please. We are going to make the Play the Land a series on FMA documentaries. Yeah. So that is thanks to all of you for the tremendous support that we've been getting. Um, part two is already in the hands of co-producer Sunny Season here, and he can tell you about it. Without giving away too much, uh, I just want to say that to understand the scope of what was done here, this is not a complete story, as you well know. It is an introduction to a comprehensive understanding of where FMA comes from, where it is in its present, and where it's going. So for Bladed Hand 2, uh, if you think about what you saw, and maybe there was some part of it that you wanted to know more detail about, that's where I'm going with Bladed Hand 2. That makes any sense. Okay? Thank you very much. I cannot thank you enough. head of the festival himself, Mr. Jonathan Laksamana. Um, thanks everyone for coming out and thanks to Jay and your, um, you know, some of the, your, uh, the people you've collaborated with for this great film. And, you know, it's, it really kind of uh, came together at the last minute. You know, you happen to be touring like right at the time we were having our festival. So, uh, yeah, thank you and thanks everyone. And, uh, yeah, look, look out for us in uh, 2013. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I would also like to acknowledge the presence of one of the, the masters in the audience tonight. Um, shall I call you master or sensei? Master Fred Dagerberg. Thank you, sir, for coming.